Um, now, uh, our trustee Lebrano has asked if he could address the board. I'm happy you're here, Anthony. I looked out for the whole meeting and didn't see you, so I'm happy to get with you after the meeting and share with you what you missed. But at this time, I'm happy to turn it over to you. I'm not sure that was called for, Mr. Chair. But point, point of, of order before I, I read my comments into the record. Uh, I've been on this board four and a half years, and I thought protocol was for us to sit alphabetically. At the last meeting, I noticed the protocol had maybe changed, and I noticed again it had changed. Is that no longer the case? Because I certainly enjoy the company of sitting next to Trustee Mosser. Mr. Chair, my fellow trustees, on March 4th, 1933, the country was almost three and a half years into what became known as the Great Depression. History will note that on that date, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was sworn in as the country's 32nd president. His inaugural address to the nation was noteworthy for its reference to the memorable phrase, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But most people don't know the words that follow. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Hmm, sounds familiar. Mr. Chair, five years ago today, Penn State was rocked by a crisis it was ill-prepared to address. Almost five years ago, this body forced the resignation of former President Graham Spanier and fired Joe Paterno without due process. Mr. Chairman, on September 17th, the Penn State community marked the 50th anniversary of Joe Paterno's first game as Penn State's head football coach. It did so not without some controversy. In recognition of these events, I thought I should reflect on where we are today, almost five years after his unjustified dismissal. Now, I recognize my remarks will make some uncomfortable, while others will not receive them well. So be it. To paraphrase Lanny Davis, a former advisor to this board, that's a risk I'll have to consider. For the past almost five years, Mr. Chair, our university has been mired in retreat. But why? Why have we not defended ourselves, and more importantly, why have we not defended our institution and our people? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. To take you back, the firestorm surrounding the grand jury presentment in November 2011 caused the political correctness crowd to immediately attack our university. The rush to judgment based on an intentionally biased, yet to be proven, document was on. Have you considered just how cleverly crafted that presentment was? Do you realize that the Office of the Attorney General knowingly deviated from the common practice of withholding from a presentment the names of those persons not charged? That makes sense, doesn't it? Why would individuals not the targets of an investigation be mentioned by name in a document used to make a prosecutor's case? In this case, however, the Office of the Attorney General broke protocol and made reference to, of all people, Joe Paterno. Although Attorney General Linda Kelly said, and I quote, he is not regarded as a target, her mere mention of Pater excuse me, Paterno achieved the desired media attention to turn a criminal case about a former Penn State employee into a public lynching of a Penn State icon. Why would the OAG resort to such a tactic? Well, the answer is quite obvious. Without Joe Paterno's name attached to this story, the story is far less salacious, far less media worthy. Add to this the fact that the presentment was, and I say this tongue in cheek, accidentally posted five years ago today, November 4th, 2011, on the OAG's website, and we can all understand the firestorm that followed. How did this, quote, accidental posting of the presentment come to pass? How did one writer and only one see the posting before it was quickly removed? And after the presentment was, was released, the world was left to believe what we now know to be an untruth. Let that sink in for a second. The most sensational portion of the presentment, the allegations were which were described in vivid detail on pages six and seven, the allegations that set into emotion a false narrative that the entire country can't, and I quote, unhear, were complete and total lies. Unfortunately, the rush to judgment was on, even here, among our own board of trustees. How could we not be horrified by what we read Referring to the graduate assistant, he saw a naked boy victim too, whose age he est estimated to be 10 years old, with his hands up against the wall, being subjected to anal intercourse by a naked Sandusky. 
Further down the page, we read the next morning, a Saturday, the graduate assistant telephoned Paterno and went to Paterno's home where he reported what he had seen. Of course, as several of our board predecessors told me in no uncertain terms, Joe Paterno was the most powerful person at Penn State and quite possibly in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I disagree. Though Joe Paterno was highly respected worldwide by alumni, students, faculty, staff, and friends alike, but he was far from the most powerful person at Penn State. That's simply a convenient excuse exercised by those looking for a person to blame. The truth is Sandusky was acquitted of those charges. Even now, the NCAA has adopted a protocol for reporting of sexual assault ostensibly modeled after the manner in which Joe Paterno handled the report from the graduate assistant. So how did we get here? How did we get to this place almost five years later where the mere mention of, of, a, commem a, chem excuse me, of, of a commemoration leads to an onslaught of media against our school? The answer is once again quite obvious. We have failed. We have failed to correct a blatantly false and very likely irreparably damaged, damaging narrative. No less than two months ago, we saw a story that refers to Joe Paterno as an enabler of a child rapist. People believe those two pages in the presentment, even though they were proven false. Quite frankly, in my opinion, we should set the record straight and honor Joe Paterno rather than simply commemorate a date in history and let the naysayers be damned. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Joe Paterno gave Penn State 61 years of unparalleled service. Yet to this day, we refuse to defend him, let alone honor him. I imagine each of us can recall where we were the night of November 9, 2011. That was the night that the university to which he had dedicated his entire life abandoned him. We fired him over the telephone, no less, unjustifiably after 61 years. As Sue Paterno said, he deserved better. Well, Sue, I agree, and so do hundreds and thousands of Penn Staters all over the world. This is not an angry minority, as some might have us believe. I'm here to tell you unequivocally that it's the overwhelming majority. In fact, I have yet to meet a Penn Stater outside of this boardroom who trusts anyone in it or believes we should move on without correcting our mistakes and, more importantly, correcting the record. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. When the university ref refused to defend the institution and its people, its alumni came forward in numbers never before witnessed by Penn State. Through social media, they connected. Their message was resounding. Three by three, the alumni replaced the board's only democratically elected trustees. 2012, 2013, 2014. All nine of them. They made it uncomfortable enough for several others to leave of their own volition. I suspect had they the power, the alumni would have replaced all the members of this body. But how did we get to that place on November 9, 2011, where our university president, a man whose vision and leadership took this institution to unparalleled academic standing, was forced to resign, and a man who gave us 61 years of remarkable service was fired? What role did former trustee and governor Tom Corbett play in this modern-day tragedy? Did his personal animus toward President Graham Spanier impact the decision-making that night? Was he behind the resignations of President Spanier and the firing of Joe Paterno? Did the former governor and trustee threaten to withdraw financial support of the university if the board did not remove the former president, President Spanier, and fire Joe Paterno? Did the former governor and trustee have a fiduciary duty to our school to inform the board of the attorney general's investigation into Jerry Sandusky? Of course he did, even though he argued that the grand jury secrecy laws precluded him from doing so. Do you think he could have found a way, if he was so motivated, to inform the board so as to avoid the damage to the Penn State community and by extension the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Of course he could have. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What followed the events of November 9, 2011 is well documented. On November 21, 2011, the Penn State Board of Trustees hired former FBI Director Lewis Free to conduct what was billed as an independent investigation. We now know this to be untrue. That investigation was anything but independent and further contributed to the forced, false narrative we have yet to correct. The former chair of the Special Investigation Task Force announced on that day, each of us in the Penn State community read the grand jury report with the same sense of dismay and anger that has stunned and shocked our entire nation and the, the wider world. We are especially heartbroken that some of these unspeakable acts could have occurred on the campus of Penn State University. We care deeply for the victims and their families whose lives have been tragically affected. 
The board also understands how difficult this has been for the students, faculty, staff, and others who are dealing with the shock and revulsion at what happened. Free himself noted, I am committed to leading the investigation into this tragic and distressing series of events and making the appropriate recommendations. But why did Penn State so readily accept responsibility for what at the time were just allegations made in a cleverly crafted presentment? On January 22, 2012, Joe Paterno passed away. Our opportunity to speak with him, to learn from him, to make peace with him was gone forever. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. On July 12, 2012, Louis Free released his 267, and I say this tongue in cheek, report, how can we ever forget? That report had its stated cost of 8.5 million, but in reality, hundreds of millions of dollars later, we are still paying for it. He began by first noting, we may extend the question period a little bit longer because there was a slight delay in getting the report up to the website. Rather curious, don't you think? A slight delay in getting the report up to the website. In actuality, he knew in advance that the server would be unavailable. How convenient. Then he added, the Special Investigations Task Force retained us to conduct a full, fair, and completely independent investigation. Again, rather curious in light of the role we now know the NCAA played in this investigation. What other organizations were involved? The Big Ten, the Office of the Attorney General, Frank Fina. Then he gave the world the impression that his, his conclusions were based on fact. The most powerful men at Penn State failed to take any steps for 14 years to protect the children that Sandusky victimized. He lied. Taking into account the available witness statements and evidence, it is more reasonable to conclude that in order to avoid the consequences of bad publicity, the most powerful leaders at Penn State University, Mr. Spanier, Schultz, Paterno, and Curley, repeatedly conceal facts relating to Sandusky's child abuse from the authorities, the Board of Trustees, the Penn State community, and the public at large. He lied again. The evidence shows that these four men also knew about a 1998 criminal investigation of Sandusky related to suspected sexual misconduct of a young boy in the Penn State locker room. And again, he lied. The evidence shows that Mr. Paterno was made aware of the 1998 investigation of Sandusky, followed it closely, but failed to take any action, even though Sandusky had been a key member of his coaching staff for about 30 years and had an office just steps away from Mr. Paterno. Once more, he lied. At the very least, Mr. Paterno could have alerted the entire football staff in order to prevent Mr. Sandusky from bringing another child into the last building. This last, last statement alone should call into question the veracity of the free report. Now, I'm sure lawyers have a professional standard, although that could be an oxymoron, but shouldn't deliberately and continually lying to a client subject an attorney to severe discipline? Of course, now we know none of these conclusions will be based on any quote-unquote facts whatsoever. Did Lewis Free reach these conclusions as a result of something other than his tongue-in-cheek independent investigation? Why did Lewis Free assign motives to behavior when he never interviewed any of the individuals in question and had access to an apparently incomplete record? Did Free's team advise him against assigning any such motives? Was Free driven by the desire of the media to assign motives immediately following the Sandusky trial? Of course, Mr. Free now wants to argue that his tongue-in-cheek conclusions were nothing more than his opinions. And no matter how many times he has been invited back to campus by the alumni to his, defend his attack on their culture, he fails to make good on that offer. Another rather curious side note is the reference Free makes on page 92 of his report. According to Free, both Graham Spanier and Cynthia Baldwin opposed an independent investigation of the Sandusky issue. According to the report, Baldwin emailed Spanier that, and I quote, if we do this, we will never get rid of this group in some shape or form. Excuse but me, Trustee Leprano, is there, do you have much more? No. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Please continue then. The board will then think that they should have such a group, Spanier agreed. Did any others, including other trustees, oppose an independent investigation? If so, then why are these people not named in the free report? On July 23, 2012, after the release of the free report, the NCAA and Penn State entered into an agreement appropriately titled Binding Consent Decree Imposed by the National Collegiate Athletic Association and accepted by the Pennsylvania State University. The free report was used as the basis for the unprecedented sanctions imposed by the NCAA. We allowed Lewis Free to attack our university with his baseless conclusions about our culture and our people. We allowed Lewis Free to tarnish the reputations of four good men without the benefit of due process. We allowed Mark Emmerich, in my opinion, himself a sanctimonious hypocrite, to use Penn State as his personal whipping post and inflict nothing short of extortion. 
emails released in the Corman of the NCAA litigation that the eventual sanctions, which included fines, scholarship reductions, and a postseason ban, were characterized by former NCAA Vice President of Enforcement Julie Rolash as a, quote, bluff. While NCAA Vice President of Academic and Membership Affairs Kevin Lennon figured the only reason Penn State would accept the sanctions was because the school was, and I quote, so embarrassed they will do anything. William Reed in his book, Joe Paterno, Hastily Tried, Unjustly Convicted, wrote, the most saddening thing about the NCAA sanctions, excuse me, actions, is that they were taken with undue haste. The Roman Publilius Cyrus wrote, haste in giving judgment is critical. I agree. If the NCAA has chosen to become a moral force in America, sweeping across college campuses in its Batmobile and finding and punishing a actions it deems to be moral transgressions, it must change its name and bylaws. The National Collegiate Avengers Association would be an appropriate name. New bylaws should define the scope of its jurisdiction and institute due process into its proceedings. We know the law says they need not employ due process, but I'm sure the esteemed men and women who lead our most prestigious universities will on reflection see that it's the right thing to do. We have vilified a man who reported what he was told, ironically, in a matter that shortly thereafter became the NCAA gold standard for assault reporting. Make no mistake, he met both his legal and moral obligations. As Joe Paterno said, with the benefit of hindsight, I would I wish I'd done more. Don't we all? Unfortunately, those words have been too often mischaracterized. In what would be my last conversation with Joe, a mere 12 days prior to his passing, I said to him, you have brought together the Penn State community in a way that no one else could. In typical paternal fashion, Joe leaned forward his left hand and index finger emphasizing his point. Hey, remember, this isn't about me. This is about our school and leaving it in a better place than we found it. To the end, his foremost concern was not for himself, but rather Penn State. Old habits die hard. So let me end where I began. Let's stop playing the political correctness crowd and do what we know to be right. Let's do what we should have done a long time ago. Let's commit to correcting a false narrative that's very long on misplaced blame and very short on truth. Let's simply honor the man. And then in the words of Roosevelt, we can finally convert retreat into advance. After all, Mr. Chairman, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other matters to come before the board? Hearings none were adjourned. Thank you.